Welcome back. Welcome back. Well, this novel here, One Day, tells the story of two English students who meet in their last days at university. We meet them on the same July day every year for the next two decades and see how their lives unfold. It's romantic, nostalgic, and has taken bestseller lists around the world by storm. Next year it will be released as a movie with Anne Hathaway and Jim Sturgis. And I'm joined now by the author, David Nichols, to find out why the story of two seemingly ordinary people has been such an extraordinary success. Well, that's a strong introductory <laughs> line there. And so tell us, why is it, why is it such a success when it, it doesn't have the normal box office uh, appeal um, on the front? I don't know. I, I wish I had a, a clear answer. I think maybe that it's the combination of of humor and drama, you know, that the book is both funny and sad, that it provokes a big emotional response. That's maybe part of it. I think maybe um, it was the right time for a big epic love story. Maybe that hadn't been done for a while. Um, the, the greatest thing ab about its success has been that it seems to be down to word of mouth, that people have read the book and really enjoyed it and, and talked to their friends about it, that it seems to have struck a chord with readers. And yes, because it, it actually came out, what, June last year? Yeah, eight last year. Ago, so. Yeah. Yeah, so oh. it's, and it's, it's gradually been released around the world and, and it seems to have taken off. So I, I started writing it four years ago, so it's very strange to still be, uh, still be talking about yeah. it, but fantastic as well. Yeah. Are you, you've had another book, certainly, made into a film. Yes. Are you nervous about uh, it being turned into a film or, or totally yes. confident? Or is no, it? I, it's always nerve wracking. I, I started as a screenwriter and uh, so I've, I've done the ad adaptation myself. Um, so I'm aware of the, the decisions you have to make. It can be quite ruthless. But uh, the director, Lona Sherfi, her previous film, An Education, I thought was wonderful and she has great integrity and I think everyone on the the film has tried to be faithful to the book in terms of its tone and its story, uh, the mixture of humour and sadness and and uh, I'm hoping it will be a, a pretty faithful adaptation. How would you just summarise the story? We briefly mentioned it there. I mean, yes. what's the most what's the most important point to make about the film in terms of I mean, of the book? Um, in that, in that period, I mean, what would you say is the, the key to the book? Is that annual event, the annual mm. time we revisit with them, is that the most important spine of the book? Well, uh, that's the sort of the big idea of yeah. the book, I suppose. Yeah. I, I think it's a book about um, friendship and about how friendships change over a long period of time. Um, it's about how we change as we grow older. I, I, my first novel was about the sort of the misery of being 20 years old, the confusion of being arriving at university and not quite knowing who you are. That was a book called Start for Ten. And I myself have just turned 40, and I was interested in you the don't difference. You did not look a day over oh, thank 30 you. Before. Well, actually, I say just turned. It was several years ago. Yeah, yes, but um, yeah. <laughs> it was some time ago. <laughs> but when I wrote the book, I just turned 40. And I was interested in the difference between, you know, our 40-year-old selves and our 20-year-old selves, how do we change, uh, in what ways do we remain the same? So I wanted to write the story of these two people, but instead of covering the usual births and marriages and deaths, I had this idea of taking 20 snapshots, if you like, just 20 yeah. seemingly ordinary days and telling the story through the events on this one particular day. Um, but that's what people seem to have responded to, both the way uh, uh, it shows the passing of time and uh, relating it to the changes in their own lives as they've got older. And, and in terms of the two characters, Emma mm. and Dexter, um, do you like one of them more than the other? You um, created them, of course, but do you like one more than the other or do you have to have absolute equal parallel feelings about both? I do like them both, but I think it's fair to say that Dexter is a lot more flawed. Dexter goes on, on a bigger journey. When he leaves university, he's very self-confident, uh, very f has a great sense of entitlement. He's a little cocky, a little arrogant. Um, Emma uh, is a wonderful person, very funny and much more intelligent than Dexter, but she's sort of crippled by a lack of self-confidence. And writing Emma was a, a real pleasure. She's she's sort of the heart of the book. Um, she's, uh, she's funny and sharp and self-deprecating and, and insecure, but incre an incredibly 
decent person, and and uh, she was a pleasure to write. Uh, she has all the best lines. But Dexter's journey, <laughs> I think hopefully by the end of the book, Dexter is a, is a better human being. It's really a redemption story, I suppose, uh, about how friendship, a, a friendship like this can improve us, make us better. This book is, is about love, yes. or is it about friendship? And well, how are they different, and which is more powerful? I, I think uh, uh, it's a sort of, it's an anti-love story in that it, it, the book isn't the, it isn't the kind of love story where two people catch each other's eye at a party and suddenly fall for each other without even speaking. It's about how friendship shades into love. Um, about, uh, again, I, I, I don't want to sort of reveal the outcome, but, but about how the overlap, if you like. Um, Dexter and Emma are very different. There are all sorts of reasons why they shouldn't be together, and yet there's this hopefully a kind of spark, a chemistry between them that, that is always there, even when they're not together. Actually, for most of the 20 years, for I think probably half of the 20 years, they don't even speak to each other. No. Um, but then there are these big, dramatic, romantic encounters every so often. And so, do you have a definition for the word we've just been talking about, love? Um, well, I think in this book, it's pretty close to companionship. You know, there is an attraction. It's not a platonic relationship at all, but there's an, uh, an understanding, a kind of... Uh, uh, Dexter has a realization at one point that Emma is the only person he really wants to talk to in a room. And I think probably that's, that's the definition. That's a good definition. And in this case, obviously, um, I was going to start getting into the plot there. I'll, 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 as you did, I will censor myself. Okay. I will censor myself from that. But do you actually, in fact, think that people do live happily ever after? Do you think, for many people, love lasts forever or not? Well, uh, it's 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 a long journey, isn't it? I I I. It's hard to say about my own life. I mean, I I actually don't have a real life Emma. I, I haven't. There's no there's no equivalent to. Uh, to uh, Emma in the book for me. I, I think I think it can work. I suppose I'm quite romantic. Um, hopefully not sentimental, but but certainly romantic in, in some ways. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I, I think it does exist and it can work, yes. Mm -hmm. Well it's a joy to have you with us and a we pleasure. look forward to seeing the movie and thank uh, you. And this going into its next edition or whatever. And yes. then and then the one after that. Thanks a million. Thank though. you. The financial crisis now. It wasn't rocket science, was it? Too much money was lent to too many people who couldn't afford to pay it back. But a new book on the crisis discovers that, yes, some of it was rocket science. At least one bank employed physicists and mathematicians to work out equations on how to make money from taking risks, and bigger and bigger risks. The book is called All the Devils Are Here. One of the authors is US business journalist Bethany McLean. And she's with us now, right now. Bethany, welcome. Thanks for having um, me. The, uh, that is a very, very good, simple, that I mean, basically, where did it start? Where did it start, really? The, 30 years ago, you said, this idea started circulating of how people could take more and more risks. Yes, we trace the beginning of the crisis to the development of something called mortgage-backed securities, which was a way of making mortgages into a tradable instrument like a bond. And at the very same time, Wall Street was developing these tools you refer to to manage risk. And what they really were was the great illusion, because it allowed people to believe that they could take more and more risk and manage it. In reality, the opposite was true. And so why was it when it finally came out, as it were. Why was it such a shock? Um, was it ludicrous that people hadn't spotted what was going on in their vast financial firms, or was it understandable? It was both. And I say it was both because throughout human history, at least throughout human financial history, these mass delusions take hold, whether the tulip mania or the tech stop mania, or in this case, the notion that home prices could only go up. And that's what everybody believed. When you look back in retrospect, you say, of course that's insane. And then you look back at some of the very real warning signs that people inside these firms got, that mortgages were being made to people who couldn't pay them back. And it seems even more more ludicrous. And so it's important possible to blame it just on self-delusion but that's a piece of the story right that's that's where it all began and uh, and when was the moment in your opinion that it, that it came to light when it, was it when two or three different companies at the same time 
it came to light at, or was it one particular place where it came to light, like the Lehman Brothers? The reason we titled the book All the Devils Are Here is because it is such a complex cast of characters. I think we all, in the aftermath of the crisis, want to find one villain. You could hold out and say, yeah. here's who did it to the financial system. And it's just not that simple. It's this cast of characters that stretches from Wall Street to Washington to Orange County, California, which was the epicenter of, of subprime lending. But I think the moment where people began to realize we were all in trouble was actually in the summer of, of, of 2007, so a year before Lehman went under. Really, and that was what, what, did one person or a small number of people suss it out in 2007 <laughs> or just one person or what? There were always, throughout the whole boom as things got crazier and crazier, there were always naysayers who, who were predicting that this, this could only be end badly. But in the summer of 2007, these two hedge funds that were run by Bear Stearns went bankrupt. And that was this, this shocking moment on Wall Street and that's when the fear really began to spread. And you managed to pick out one person who, uh, who was your hero of this whole crisis. Mr. Bothwell, yes. <laughs> Why was he your hero in this crisis? He's, he's one of our few heroes, and he's a sort of bureaucrat, civil ser servant, worked at the General Accounting Office in the 1990s. But he tried very hard to argue that derivatives should be more closely monitored. And when you look back at what he was actually arguing, he wasn't saying we should ban derivatives. He wasn't saying we should make them impossible to trade. He was just saying, look, let's have some transparency here. Let's make sure we all know what's going on so that if there ever is a problem, we can do something about it. And the industry pushed, and other regulators pushed back very hard against him, and nothing ever happened. Happened. Has Wall Street, for instance, learned from this experience or are a lot of the same people there getting the same huge bonuses and so on and has nothing changed? This is a story of human nature and human nature and all its complexity from greed and arrogance and ego and ambition and corruption and human nature doesn't change. So I think to say that, that things have changed is to sort of fly in the face of, of human history. And then specifically about, about the financial industry, no, I don't think anything has changed. I think there's a huge gap between how the financial industry sees the world and how the person on the street sees the, sees the world. And it's, it's shocking to me and rather frightening to me. Is there one saying that you would, one grand lesson you would learn from all of this? One grand lesson. I think it's that you can never um, overestimate the amount of incompetence in the world. And stories of business gone wrong always involve uh, a hefty dose of, of, of incompetence. Wall Street was supposed to be adept at managing risk. All these tools that you pointed out in the beginning of our, of our conversation that Wall Street had developed, this is what they were supposed to do. It turned out that not only did they destroy the, the financial system, but that many of them destroyed themselves as well. And so can you assure us that what happened in 2007 um, will never happen again? Can you assure us of that? Can you pledge that? Absolutely not. You know, there's a tendency, at least in the United States, to believe that more regulation is the answer. If we put more rules in place, then we can prevent things from happening in the past. The, the, the problem is that it's not just the rules, it's the willingness of the regulators to enforce those rules and their ability to enforce those rules. And both of those things were in short supply during the decades leading up to the financial crisis. And I, I don't know why I would think it's any different today. Thank you very much for that. That's, uh, well, thank you very much. It's not exactly good news, but uh, it's just a guarantee that we will live unhappily ever after. We will live If we can't do times. it happily. <laughs> exactly. Thanks, a, thanks a mil. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks to WikiLeaks, we know quite a lot more than we did just a week ago about how America views the world. Many of the revelations are less than surprising that U.S. diplomats, for instance, find Angela Merkel is risk averse or that Hamid Karzai can be a bit paranoid. But when it comes to Russia, no punches are pulled. It is, they say, a virtual mafia state where one cannot differentiate between the activities of the government and organized crime groups. Lucky then that billionaire Russian businessman Evgeny Lebedev and his father Alexander now operate out of London uh, rather than Moscow. Certainly in the case of Evgeny, he spent most of his life over here. His father was a KGB man in uh, London when Evgeny was a child. And now Evgeny owns two of Britain's best known newspapers with his father, London, London's Evening Standard and The Independent Group. 
Welcome, Evgeny. Good to have you with us. Thank you, David. Is it? You are really based here, and now, congratulations, you're a citizen and so on. Thank so, you. So, with the interests in this country, for instance, rather than Russia, um, that's more you than, than your father, yeah? And, and vice versa in Russia. Yes, that's, um, I've been here since I was eight. Um, love living here, and all my work is mainly based here. So, yes, the, we, and, and whatever operation we have in Russia, that's more my father. And, that, and here, the, the two newspapers are spearheads, aren't they? The Evening Standard first, London's only evening newspaper, and, uh, and then move it, moving on to the independent group and so on. And so that, that takes up most of your time at the moment, doesn't it? Yes, yes, I would say so. The Evening Standard, which happened about two years ago, and to me, it is the voice of London, the only voice of London. And I, I love the city. I think that it is the most exciting city in the world. It's a, it's a real melting pot of culture. Uh, that comes from all parts of the world and a really exciting city to live in and very uh, proud and honored to be part of a newspaper that is the only voice of London. And The Independent is, um, happened last year and it is uh, a really respected title. It's uh, got great journalism, great writing and it stands up for independence and, and, and freedoms. And in the case of the Evening Standard, of course, you, you took a, a daring course there by, in order to increase the circulation, and et cetera, you, you now give it out to people free, and from a circulation of about 300,000, it's gone less. up to 700,000, hasn't it? Yes, it's even, it was even less. It was uh, less than 200,000, and our readership figures were just below half a million. Now we've gone up to, we've just gone up this autumn to 700,000, and our readership figures are over a million and a half. So um, it was quite a gamble. It was the first ever newspaper in the world, a quality newspaper, to go free. And the big task for us was to keep the quality and persuade the advertisers and the readers that taking it free will, will, will retain the quality and still remain the Evening Standard of London. And what you had to hope was that the, uh, the advertisers would keep coming flooding in to a free newspaper as they had done with the newspaper that people had to pay for. Yes, absolutely, and also pay more for the advertising, which is difficult to persuade advertisers that they have to pay more for a newspaper that is free, that is given away. But we've managed to do that, and um, it seems to be a very successful business model. And by next year, um, if nothing major changes in the economy, if there isn't a, say, a double dip or uh, another major disaster, we should break even, which would be an incredible turnaround for, for a newspaper to happen in recent years. That's very exciting. What about the, uh, the, all of the internet and the various things that seem as though they may encroach on uh, newspapers, in particular television, but as well? But, uh, but, I mean, do you think the future is with the newspapers or not? I believe in newspapers. I think when television was invented in the beginning of the 20th century, um, people were predicting death of newspapers. Now we're a century later, We've still got, this country reads over 10 million newspapers daily, so that's more than one in six um, of the population of this country read papers still. I think um, papers will be around for, for years to come still. The internet, of course, has taken away readership, and so has the iPad, but still, the, in the financial sense, all the re revenue comes from, uh, revenue streams in a newspaper company all still come from the printed product, and, um, and if you go in the tube um, in the evening or in the morning, you see almost every second person reading a newspaper. So I, I, I think newspapers will stick around for years to come. And, uh, well, that's good news for, well, it's amazingly good news for newspaper owners, I was going to say for readers, but that would be particularly good news for, for, for owners and so on. And in terms of uh, your father does a lot more, lot, a multitude of different... Uh, Yes, business, he isn't he? He's adding to them all the while, isn't he? He does. He's, uh, he's got a huge portfolio in, in Russia, which includes uh, airlines, includes um, affordable housing construction, banking, properties, and more. So quite a diverse man he is. And uh, obviously, it appears in his bios and so on, um, when he was here in London and was working as a spy at, at that time for KGB. Did you know that, or did you find out that later? I didn't. Uh, we, we moved here when I was eight, so yeah. um, I didn't know at the time. 
and I'm not sure I would have even realized what it meant then. <laughs> but uh, um, I found out because um, I started finding medals from time to time laying around the house for, for good work, for, for good service to the country given to Alexander, to my father. So I've, I've, I was asking my parents what, what that was, and that was how I found out. Oh, really? How first I discovered, yeah. yes. So how long did he do that for? He um, left university and went straight on to the foreign intelligence and his first posting was here in London which was a great honor because usually you would have to step uh, from your first your first job would be somewhere in, in the Middle East and then you might be in Eastern Europe and then you then up in London and his first job was in, in London so it was here for four years and then he left foreign intelligence when we returned yeah. and, and his form of intelligence was 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 uh, was not cloak and dagger type of uh thrilling uh, espionage it was it was more in in print and information was it yes because i think by that time um that form of espionage has has come to a stop that was more in the 50s and 60s maybe early 70s by late 80s it was more um just an, an analytical espionage seeing seeing the situation the economic situation political situation and re reporting it back home not sure we might have re returned to the cloak and dagger back now, but <laughs> <laughs> but we're still certainly not not um, then, not not in the late 80s. Yeah. And in terms of uh, Russia itself, I mean, the Russia very much in the news today because of getting the World Cup yes. next time around. Um, but I mean, how do you? And then the quotes we give about it, mafia in Russia and so on and so forth. Do you think of Russia today as prosperous, troubled, unfree? How do you think of your original home? Well, I'm not, I'm not so sure Russia has deserved to win the World Cup after all the, the WikiLeaks information that's come out in the last 48 hours. Um, but on the other hand, if, if it means improvement in the life of ordinary Russians, may, it, maybe it's a good thing. Um, what do I think of? I have very conflicted views of Russia because on one hand I feel very much Russian I still retain my Russian British citizenship for now anyway yeah. <laughs> I've uh, I was born there um, I lived there the formative years of my life and also my my ancestors are buried there so I I have great affiliation with Russian literature with, with Russian countryside and Russian ordinary people but I don't like what Russia has become in the last 10 years I don't like the fact that people don't have liberties. I don't like the fact that journalists get beaten up and killed. Um, I don't like that financial organizations are being raided. And I don't like um, the reputation we have made for ourselves in the West. And you know, it's no wonder that there's a huge speculation with the knowledge of the bribery in FIFA plus the corruption in Russia ordinary person in UK on the street after the United Kingdom was defeated yesterday will put two and two together and, and of course, um, draw their conclusions. Mm, absolutely. Well, great to have you with us. Uh, do you have your eye on a third newspaper group in the UK? <laughs> Not so far, David, no. but I think the, the two that we have acquired are, um, there's still a lot of work to come and, and, and still a lot to do with them. So, so uh, no, I, no, not, nothing yet. Yeah. Well, we. We look forward to talking about it when it comes along, as I'm sure it will. Thanks ever Thank so much. Thank you very much, David. And we were talking there about the uh, World Cup, and of course we should end by saying to, to all of our friends over there in Qatar, huge congratulations on winning the World Cup. Well, not winning, having the World Cup, we should say at this point, I suppose, in 2022. So that, that's a great achievement for the uh, giant killers from Qatar. Thank you for joining us this week. See you at the same time next week.